I'd now like to introduce my friend and longtime CUNY Center ally, Susanna Pollock. She is the president of Games for Change, the organization best known for their annual Games for Change Festival, which I've attended. Um, it's also known as the Sundance of video games. She has also launched and grown a Games for Change student challenge that started here in New York City and is now in seven cities. And folks in the room, of course, may also know her for having created the XR for Change initiative to build a community of practice around using XR to improve lives. I'd now like to invite her to introduce our first keynote speaker, Susanna. Well, thank you, Michael, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm very excited about today. Um, serving on the advisory committee, I've been uh, had the privilege of uh, talking with the XRA and Ses and um, uh, Joan Gans Cooney folks about uh, what kind of convening uh, would be the most productive in this space. And I'm really excited about the schedule and the program that they've lined up and even more excited about the people who have come to listen today. Um, so my job right now is to introduce our first speaker and then I'm gonna come back and uh, facilitate a Q&A. Um, I imagine a lot of people are gonna wanna talk to him. Uh, it's really uh, a, a tremendous uh, force uh, within the XR community. Um, I'll give you a, just a brief description about some of the things that he's accomplished. So Gabo Aurora not only is a friend um, and a, a regular speaker at uh, the Games for Change Festival, um, he is a world-renowned and award-winning immersive artist, professor, entrepreneur, and former UN diplomat who works uh, along with the most cutting-edge emerging technologies, including both virtual and augmented reality. Um, he's often recognized as a pioneer of new documentary formats, and in fact, his work is part of the permanent collection of the M Museum of Modern Art in New York. Gabba was designed and led many social impact campaigns, raising millions of dollars for the UN, UNICEF, USC Shoah Foundation, and the Nobel Peace Prize Committee. He was also had the honor of being the UN's first ever creative director, a Davos World Economic Forum Arts and Culture Leader and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, what is relevant, I think, also for this conversation is that Gabo is currently the founding director of a new lab at John Hopkins University called Immersive Storytelling and Emerging Technologies, ISET. Um, and then while he's busy doing all of these incredible things, he does have his own creative tech and production studio called Lightshed, which is based uh, in Brooklyn. So with all of that, with that well-deserved intro, um, I will now hand the mic over to Gabo for his presentation and then return for a Q&A in about 25 minutes. Gabo, over to you. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for, uh, let me, Oh, goodness. Let me just see if this works. Sorry. We had tested everything, and then there's a little thing. Hi, everybody. It looks like we're having some technical difficulties here. Um, and I thought I would sing a little song for everybody. I'm actually just kidding. I'm not going to sing. Um, so I, what, I, what I'll what i do is invite uh, folks to continue to share um, their background in the comments. Um, it's great to see so many of you here. Thank you for making time today. Um, and again, I realized that the uh, this is a bit of a marathon session, um, and we hope you can stay for as much as possible or at least dodge in and out as your day allows. Okay. okay. Hi, Gabo. Can you try refreshing? Okay. Sorry about that. Hi, Gabo. It's clear here in the background. Uh, feel free if you need some help just to get your slides back on and you're ready to go back on screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? 
I can right now. Yes, certainly. Let me just jump off here. Thanks for everyone's patience. <laughs> Let me know when I can start. You are free to start, Gabo. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for the little hiccup. Thank you so much, Susanna, for that wonderful um, introduction. Um, like Susanna mentioned, um, I work with new technologies like virtual and augmented reality. Um, and now uh, I really see the potential of immersive technologies for learning, for behavior change, for emotion to be um, boundless and it's been an incredible journey. Uh, I do a lot of my work through my creative studio called Light Shed, which is based out of Brooklyn. Um, but as Susanna said, I'm also a faculty member at Johns Hopkins. Um, so I just, you know, I like to make up new words that aren't in the dictionary. And I think what really made me feel um, that was incredible about this technology, especially virtual reality, is that it really could shed light on, on an issue and make us understand it in ways that traditional media it doesn't, um, that even real life in some way doesn't. And so um, a big sort of inspiration for me, if anyone is looking to know more about the potential of these technologies is Jaron Lanier, who's widely considered kind of the grandfather of all the VR movements. Um, Lightshed, you know, we collaborate and we create experiences with um, people all over, whether it's corporations and NGOs and people really come to us to see how we can kind of use these technologies to kind of create empathy and a resulting action that comes from that. Um, and a lot of this is kind of merging into training um, where a lot of people are looking for ways to have difficult conversations uh, in the workplace to really look at using the power of immersive technology to kind of get people to learn and understand and go through certain simulations. So um, what's been a real challenge is not only am I a creator um, in VR and AR and AI and immersive audio and wherever else this wild ride of new technology takes us. Um, and that's why I called our new program Immersive Storytelling and Emerging Technologies, because right now, it's focused a lot on virtual reality and augmented reality. But going forward, as we are going forward with the rapid changes in blockchain technology and machine learning and virtual beings and everything I'll kind of touch upon a bit, uh, we want to encompass a lot of that. And what the program at Hopkins has really taught me is how do you teach this stuff? How do you make it relevant? How do you make it feel like someone can be a creator in this space? that can be very intimidating. This is just a brief video of our sort of mission statement. Every new artistic movement is because of a new technological possibility. We want to use these new technological possibilities for new artistic expressions. So we want to continue to foster that and give storytellers and artists the tools to do that with these technologies. I said, is the first nationally recognized MA program that has a concentration in immersive storytelling and emerging technologies. I said is absolutely fundamental to my work at this stage. There's no precedent at all for my work. And so I'm really creating something new. I'm creating technologies to support those experiences. I need to be partnered with institutions like ISAT in order to bring that to life. Storytelling is changing. The future of storytelling is with emerging technologies. I said importance and relevance is that it's put a flag in the ground and it's saying that this medium is valid, the messages coming from this are important, and the artists and students that are engaging with this medium need to be supported because they're going to become the voices of not just the present but of the future. It's really through storytelling that you're going to be able to understand the potentials of these technologies and be able to offer something artistic, 
no matter what field you use these technologies for. Our sole entire focus is using emerging technologies for storytelling. So that's just a little bit about who we are um, and some of the courses that we have. We really try to see how we can combine forces with Sundance and even Stanford to kind of create new ways that immersive sort of projects can shed light on, on many different issues. Um, and we have a summit that we had uh, right before the pandemic. And, you know, we've had projects that have come out that have uh, dealt with maternal health, with climate change, with um, a project by Diego Galafasi, who was an artist in residence uh, at Hopkins, who created a project called Breathe, which is visualizing your breath and see how it connects to the atmosphere and to plants and to, to everything around us using um, mixed reality with a Magic Leap headset. So, you know, <clears throat> there's a lot of um, hype and no hype uh, when you talk about these technologies, you know, and they have always gone through kind of, you know, their peaks and their kind of things go down. And I think we're seeing similar things happen now with blockchain and crypto and, you know, AI went through a winter. So, you know, a lot of new technologies, there's always a kind of bumpy ride. Um, but what I think is incredible when you kind of put, there's Google and then there's Google Scholar. Um, and when you put virtual reality learning or virtual reality, and I encourage you all to do that, the number of citations have just kind of exploded and continue to be very interesting, um, showing that this technology has some new way of interfacing with our neurobiology in some ways um, and can create um, new perspectives and, and new feelings. And a lot of it, of course, is this new technology that's very immersive um, and can and will continue, I think, to become more immersive. Uh, but what is fascinating is that it's the storytelling, it's the kind of creativity that kind of merges with the technology, which is a lot of what uh, my work has focused on. Um, because I think um, it's very easy to get seduced by the technology, but really it's the ability to tell a story with this new technology that makes things really um, amazing. I, I put this slide up because I do a lot of work um, with very bureaucratic uh, uh, institutions sometimes. and corporations and other places and they all want the innovation but never is there a true understanding of the creative uh, process sometimes and I think I'm leading with that because at the core of it I'm an artist and I feel that art should be uh, risky and provocative and be allowed to fail and I think a lot of creativity is not around a utilitarian goal of achieving something sometimes you're just exploring in a sandbox um, so I really encourage if you go forward that the design process for a lot of these things should be playful should be patient should be tolerant um, of risk uh, because there is an enormous amount of risk and failures that happen when you try to work with new technologies and try to create new experiences with them. Um, but then they do eventually lead to incredible innovations if that space is given. Um, I put this picture up just to talk a little bit about my own journey of where I'm kind of coming from. Um, I'm, uh, I studied philosophy and filmmaking um, at NYU. I'm a native New Yorker. I grew up in, in Queens and I, um, Grew up and went to school in the 90s, where I think, by all accounts, uh, considered a very idyllic period, uh, given especially what's happening now. But I always felt a sense of unease of what was happening with commercialism and just what was happening to our planet, um, and was really also involved with um, what was happening with climate change and mass consumerism and a kind of economic model that was dominating the globe at that time. And I came upon this picture um, and it was at a Barnes and Nobles uh, with a magazine called Adbusters. And it just really, I think, took my trajectory in a different way. Um, I grew up going to India. My parents are originally from there. And I saw India transform through consumer goods as it opened up to the global market. And I really felt there was just something 
missing, that there was something in the traditional media and the narrative that was, was wrong. And, and I would find it through art and I would find it through, in a lot of ways, through this medium to express like a kind of narrative and perspective that wasn't coming across because of what this technology can provide. I think new technologies um, should make us question our status quo, should make us think about how we do things and how they are kind of decisions and design decisions that we make. And that new technologies can kind of speculate and create a whole new physics of being, a whole new metaphysics in some ways. And I, I look at that in the way that, you know, time is kind of in our world right now. It's mostly through industrial time. But there are many different ways to kind of think about it. I was reading, you know, that there was many more time zones than there are now in the United States. That at one time they were deciding that noon is when actual, <laughs> the actual sun is right, you know, above you. Um, and that that should when noon be everywhere. So I think these new technologies um, combined with storytelling, I think should help us shape and rethink just our world and that it's not an escape into another world, that in some ways we go through that and I think we come back realizing how we could make our world better. Um, uh, so having said that, um, I did a lot of, um, after that picture, <laughs> I did a lot of humanitarian work and I've worked uh, with international NGOs. I was, with, I was a staff member at the UN. I was a consultant for UNICEF. I lived and worked in Namibia, in Colombia, in Haiti, in Zambia. I can go on. Uh, and where I you know, was constantly struck by the, the beauty and resilience of people on the ground, really taking charge to kind of deal with problems that are um, problems for all of us and how we look at war and conflict and a lot of other things that we have to deal with. Um, so I, I did all of that and it was around 2014 where I discovered VR more in 360 filmmaking. And I created my first project uh, in collaboration with Chris Milk, um, who uh, also is an incredible VR pioneer who was able to lend me his camera, and it was me and my DP, Barry Pausman, who, because we were at the UN, were able to take this new technology and do a tour of Zatari camp. And we created Clouds Over Sidra, which um, for a lot of people was their first VR experience that they, that they experienced as VR was becoming more mainstream. And it's really in this experience that you realize that there is this whole new power to affect people. Um, but again, in a very different narrative, um, many people would be emotionally affected by this film, but there wasn't anything overtly sad. It was more the inner life of Sidra and how we just captured certain things. So this is just a short case study to show you what this film was able to do. According to the United Nations, the number of countries struggling with humanitarian crises is at an all-time high. The international community hasn't experienced this many refugees, asylum seekers, and displaced persons since World War II. But how do we galvanize policymakers who are sometimes so far removed from the world's crises? The United Nations needed a new tool to amplify empathy, which is why UN advisor Gabo Aurora and Verse creator Chris Milk teamed up to create a VR experience from the perspective of 12-year-old Syrian refugee named Sidra. Of the millions who have fled the Syrian civil war, over 84,000 have taken up temporary residence in the Satari refugee camp in Jordan, without any clear indication of when they can go home. In order to communicate this ongoing frustration, Verse captured Sidra's story with the aid of Verse's proprietary 360-degree camera technology. The footage was then stitched together using Verse tool software and made ready in time for the World Economic Summit in Davos. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and Emma Watson were among the dignitaries backing the launch of Clouds Over Sidra. The film was experienced by over 120 global leaders who all experienced Sidra's refugee camp through her eyes. Donations to the Syrian refugee effort have skyrocketed since the rollout of Clouds. The piece also screened at Sundance, South by Southwest, the TED Talks, and the Third International Humanitarian Appeal for Syria, which was held in Kuwait. Countless humanitarian advocates, policymakers, and the general public have experienced Sidra's story. Clouds Over Sidra is the first in a series of collaborations between Verse and the UN. With demand for touching VR experiences on the rise, the UN has found its empathy machine. Well, I'm going, I'm going to stop there and I, I'll just say, 
I'll just say that I was like, <laughs> I'm crying inside this. This is probably one of the most vivid experiences of my life. So I think uh, I'll just move forward a little bit here um, to some of the measurable, measurable impact um, that comes from a lot of this um, work. And I think Clouds Over Cedra really showed that there's something there it, that one is able to kind of get the storytelling right and to use the technology that it can have, um, make enormous change that other things cannot. Um, and so we, we adopted it with face-to-face -face fundraising with UNICEF and it has consistently doubled uh, donations and has been translated into 15 languages. And it's, um, it was a game changer for, for a lot of how it would work. Um, it's also been used to kind of sensitize refugees coming into Canada and we've explored piloting it in other countries. Um, and so I think, you know, from there, that was very simple 360 film. And I've gone on to then say, okay, you know, this is just the beginning of how we're defining this new medium. What are other ways that we can, we can do this? And, you know, we continue to make things around Ebola. Uh, we did something in Gaza, again in 360, and it was very uh, edifying. Um, in 2017, I decided to, to leave the UN and start and work on full, you know, on Lightshed full time and, and to do other things. And I was really fascinated by game engines. Um, game engines like Unity and Unreal are generally made to make games. And we were looking at it to make VR experiences that were very cinematic. Um, and working in a game engine is different than 360 video because there's more interactivity. There's the ability at times for you to walk around and explore and move your head, as they say, with six degrees of freedom. And I um, had this idea to do something around the Holocaust. And I um, very boldly uh, got in touch with Steven Spielberg and his Shoah Foundation and was able to meet Steven Spielberg and to say, hey, this new technology is really powerful. Uh, I have this idea of how we can use photogrammetry to really map out a concentration camp and have people go through it in ways they wouldn't otherwise. And we didn't want to stop there. We wanted to kind of merge a real survivor into that space who can talk and, and tell about their experience of being there when they were young. Um, and so this is just a small snippet of a case study to show you what this can do for history, for teaching, um, for remembrance. Last Goodbye is a powerful personal testimony of the Holocaust, preserved for the first time in poignant room-scale virtual reality. Survivor Pinkhus Guter takes audiences with him on one last visit to the Nazi concentration camp Maidani, as he says a final goodbye to his family, who were murdered there during World War II. In 2016, the production team traveled with Guter to Poland to capture hours of 3D video and tens of thousands of photos, which were then brought to life with dozens of photogrammetry artists and engineers. The entire experience uses the most innovative new technology to enable viewers to walk with Guter eye to eye as he revisits the railway car, gas chamber, shower room, and barracks of Maidan. USC Shoah Foundation has created the first ever Holocaust survivor testimony in room scale VR, which will be entered into their official archive generations to come. USC Shoah Foundation is dedicated to making audiovisual interviews with survivors of the Holocaust and other genocides as a compelling voice for education and action. The experience premiered at Tribeca Film Festival 
and has toured internationally at a host of public screenings, including Venice Film Festival, Future of Storytelling, and is now available to global audiences. Dort will man stift sich in der Freude, in die Wagone. So, you know, the journey continues. Um, you know, that was where you could walk around. Um, with my next sort of experience um, after the, the last goodbye, um, we really wanted to do something that, to counter the rising Islamophobia that was uh, taking, taking hold of the world after the Syrian refugee crisis and, and Trump's ban on Muslims. And I really thought, you know, what if there's something where you have a social experience where you can bring people together and they could learn about uh, Sufism, which is a kind of mystical and tolerant and musical side of Islamic practice that I think would really sensitize people that there isn't this monolithic um, Islamic identity that the media portrays, that really it is quite nuanced as it's nuanced in all of our different traditions and religions, that there are extremists, but there are also a lot of people who are very open and tolerant. So we did a, an experience that I think was musical and a way of using volumetric capture and presence of another. And this is just a short track. So um, that was really amazing to see people dance and let loose, but also become a lot more sensitive. And this experience has been in the Abu Dhabi Louvre and was acquired by Dog Wolf as the first sort of like social documentary to be acquired in Sundance's history. Um, again, we did something similar with the Nobel Peace Prize Committee around nuclear proliferation and testimonies from Japanese survivors. Um, and I'll just go through a little bit uh, some of the things. Uh, one point, because I know we, we have a couple of minutes, the one point I'd like to make is a lot of the things that I've done have been very visual and very interactive, but really there's just so much to be done just thinking about immersive sound and what sound can do to make us feel present and how we can make through immersive and spatial audio another way of kind of learning and storytelling and emotion. Um, and this was a project that my partner, uh, Lauren Aurora Hutchinson, did, which was just using audio to create a kind of immersive landscape of the Camino de Santiago, which is a, a trail that people run, uh, sorry, walk and, and for spiritual enlightenment. So um, we've gone on to do things in spatial computing. This was a project on the eviction crisis. Um, I won't keep going, but you can see things just change a lot. I think an eviction is something that a child will never forget um, into their adulthood. Um, and, and there are things in our lives like that, um, that either scar or um, stay with us forever. And, and we either channel that in a way that is healing and um, life affirming, or it becomes something that, you know, forever scars us and, and pains us and, and we struggle through. So that was an exhibit. And that shows you, again, from 360 video to a physical installation using mixed reality glasses to know about the eviction crisis. It was just incredible. But I think I'll stop here um, because I think we want to have some time for some questions. Um, I couldn't see anyone. I hope people heard me. I hope this has worked. <laughs> and uh, let's stick the time. 
Yeah, I think it's great. I think so. Um, we can get an, uh, get a text to see how many minutes we have for the chat. Otherwise, I'll take the full 10. Um, but Gabo, thank you so much for sharing with us um, some of your work and your thoughts on uh, the evolution of virtual reality. Um, and it is an evolution, right? And, uh, and we are just at the beginning. That's what's just yeah. so remarkable, right? about this. Um, so while uh, people may have some thoughts about um, some comments or questions, which I can field, I'm going to start with, well, I say first a reflection. Um, I mean, one, it's an incredible body of work. So really, really, it's really, uh, I mean, not impressive, but, it, uh, but also important. And I feel like you have, you know, from the very beginning of your work in the space, you know, use the technology to um, address, you know, difficult and and uh, important topics. Um, I want to think it's incredible that the UN allowed you <laughs> to do this at the very early, right, the, the very early stages of, of VR and, and to, to their credit and to yours to have that vision. Um, I, I'm, it's fascinating that Clouds over Sidra might have been the first VR experience that diplomats, right, dignitaries have yeah. ever experienced. And yeah, um, I, I'm curious as you have made your pieces for different audience groups. Um, it's I, I see a lot for policymakers uh, for uh, that have lived through the festival circuits. Um, general publics are seeing it. I was wondering if you've had any experiences where. Um, where youth, whether it was college or high school students, have come through it, and uh, have, are there any anything that you can remark about the differences of having that those age groups come through it versus um, you know someone from the, a policymaker? Yeah, you know, at Hopkins also, uh, Hopkins has a high school um, program where very talented high school students will go through um, college level courses, and I, I teach one of them, which is like a short one over the summer on VR and AR. Um, and I just find that the, I'm finding that the younger the uh, population, um, the more they're very much engaged with this and they're less skeptical. Um, and I, I think they're more, they more see it as something that is an inevitable future. Um, and so that part of it, I think is always exciting because they just really, really, really resonate with it because technology is something that's native to them. And I think they're all yearning for expressions of a technology that's more than just dominated by social media and tech mm -hmm. and tech, you know, I think they like it, that it has this sort of um, ability to immerse yourself in something that's very meaningful. Um, so I found it to be really um, that the younger it is, the more easy it is to get people to create and to dive into it and to do it. Um, and I think some of it is, you know, um, I do think when anyone, any, anyone, anywhere can kind of do these things, they realize it's potential, but younger people, I think are looking for like shaping new mediums and coming up with new ways and being a part of something that um, isn't a part of something now, you know? Um, and I think that's, what's really exciting. Um, and that's what excited me uh, because I have a filmmaking background. I can make films. I have. I've done that. But after you discover this, you're like, how can I? It's, this is a whole new medium. This is a whole new way to express and create uh, emotion in people. So that's what I think is is what they really feel. And I think if you invest in it and you think about it, there'll be. It really sends a signal that you're really looking at the future and not just trying to preserve the present. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I have a question uh, from uh, from Lulian Radu, who wants to know if oh the question is a, up there. Look at that. Do you work <laughs> with psychologists and social workers to ensure the participants are carefully impacted? If yes, how do you can you talk about that collaboration? Um, I think we always when we deal with a heavy um, topic are always partnering with experts who, whether it's UNICEF or the Show Foundation or, you know, um, anything, uh, most recent experience we did, did called Paradise, it's in partnership with a researcher at Johns Hopkins who works on, on intimate partner violence and trauma. So 
we really try to build a curriculum. We really try to think about how this is rolled out. I think a lot of it, the headset is really just, I think, a conversation starter or getting people to understand things in a certain way. But there's so much, um, there's so much that is happening that can be built around this uh, experience, you know? Um, and so we, uh, Clouds of Cedro has had many curriculum that has been built mm -hmm. around it. And, and so that's how we are able to assure it. Um, I do think when I started in 2014 and now there is a, a lot more, um, I get more of these types of questions because I think the culture in general is trying to be more sensitive, which is great. And so we're looking to kind of be more upfront with our trigger warnings and trying to make sure people feel comfortable um, and don't be taken aback by some of the subject matter. But, you know, most of the work is not sensational. That's what's really incredible about it. It's actually very simple, but still very emotional because it's not trying to go into, it's not going there. It's really just trying to show how life is and what the reality of things are. But that's the power of VR, the very ordinary experiences of just walking or standing next to a window with a child next to you in the virtual space is very emotional and very compelling. So that's what I think we have to create and keep exploring that grammar because it's not, it's not the sensationalism that kind of works in this yeah. medium. Um, so uh, one of the things that we, I've been thinking about when, when we are presenting uh, VR work, and I think it's what you're talking about too, is that, ra that wraparound content, right? So it, particularly in a more formal environment where you do want somebody to um, come out of the experience, either to take action or to understand something in particular is we've been thinking about, you know, there's the onboarding process and then there's the aftercare. It's like caring for these people, right? So who have yeah. gone through this emotional experience and giving them a moment to either decompress and and to or to digest information and and help people to to take that experience into their lives right to take action um yeah no i i think that's essential i think we even going back we maybe didn't do that as as much um you know in the early environment of just exhibits and everything but right I think yep. it's something going forward, even with the, mm -hmm. the older content, we can repurpose yep. with that in mind. Yep. So Mike, um, so Michael has a question, um, wanting to look at the, the creators, right, of Future VR. And you say you've been working with high school students. Um, if there, if these experiences, right, if the opportunities don't exist in schools, yeah. are, are there pathways for them that you're aware of? Um, you know, I, I think, um, I think, it's starting to change. Um, and I think a lot of it is um, really being exposed to certain tools. There's, you know, we use a tool called Geometry, which many people don't know about, but it's basically a WebXR kind of prototyping platform. And you can build in, you know, take existing 3D assets and kind of create like a metaverse really quickly and, and build what you need to do. I, I think a lot of it does exist that is possible. Um, and there are a lot of free courses of how you could even explore Unity or Unreal if you wanted to go even more in a more sophisticated way. Uh, it's just about allowing people, you know, supporting their journey on that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it it's more the gap exists of what people know is there to tell their students. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. they're it's just becoming more and more democratic. When I went, and because of procedure, we had to build our own camera, you know, right. and that's no longer and, and build the software to kind of edit it and create stereo. You know, that's all of a sudden that's not it's very easy workflow and it's yeah. very affordable to do 360 video. But yeah. how many people are incorporating it? How many people see the, the use and value of it? So I think once you do and go down that rabbit hole, it's very easy to build up a curriculum and support young people. It's not yeah. as hard. Yep. It's and it's scaffolded like anything else, right? I mean, there are other very simple tools. I know that um, Emily uh, Joy here has a platform called Zoe, um, and there are others like that. There's Merge Cube, and there's you know spa co spaces. I mean, there there are very very um, you know simple uh, opportunities for 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 students to have a taste, right? And get excited about it, right? And then scaffold their way up to working with yeah. more of the professional. 
Yeah, I do. I do have to pl do a plug because uh, yeah. we uh, games for change student challenge that has been running for many years. A lot of you got a lot of people here are, are aware of it, but we just um, finished our first XR curriculum to allow middle and high school students to learn how to make experiences mm -hmm. um, as part of this program. Um, and the teachers that are facilitating our, our program are not technology teachers are creative. Mm -hmm. So we had to make it super simple for the educators to then be able to present it to um uh to the students who are much more sophisticated than the teachers anyway so um all right i think we probably have room for one or two or maybe one last question um i will um I do. I have one. I have a question for you that I'm curious about. Now that you've worked in the space for over eight years, starting with 360 video, gone into working in the games engines and photogrammetry, do you still think there is space for 360 video? Do you think you still work in that medium, or are you excited about what that that's what's new and what's possible? I mean, 360 video is like my first love, you know, uh, and and really I think is a great gateway into understanding immersive worlds and getting into the right mindset um, of what it is. And, um, you know, I have a filmmaking background, so I love its emotion and its ability to transport you and connect you. Um, and I, I think it's amazing. A lot of my work is you always using to kind of merge game engine with 360 and to like integrate it into metaverse experiences, um, which I think whether through portals, whether through transitions, um, you know, there's different ways. So. I, I think it has, um, in of itself, I think, as a standalone thing, um, maybe it hasn't matured, but there's just something very powerful about it that I think what it alludes to is we will one day be able to walk through that 360 video, right? We'll be able to kind of feel that it's the closest approximation to what we're feeling now in that world when you, you know, have it work right. So I, I still love it. I still use it. People still call me to do it. And I'll great. do it sometimes because I yeah, think it's really great. powerful for certain use great. cases. Um, do I have time for another question? I'm going to keep going until someone someone tells me to stop. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, what might be the last question is um, just looking, and this is from Robin White Owen. Um, can you imagine other ways of doing, um, of helping develop empathy by teaching subjects in VR, traditional subjects? Yeah, that is, that is actually... Um, I mean, th there is that is so early, but so great. I've seen out of MIT, you know, teaching physics in VR, you know, which obviously the visualizations and how it could work. I think history, which we've kind of, you know, alluded oh. to, I think more and more needs to be kind of done there, but it needs to merge with the right aesthetics and storytellers, you know. So I think that's where you need to have that combination of people who understand curriculum and education, but work with designers and, and storytellers and artists. And that doesn't happen as often as it should mm -hmm. uh, yeah. in our society. Uh, and I think if you can ha make that happen, you'll have something great happen. Uh, but it, I haven't, I haven't seen that as much. Um, yeah, I, I, I do agree. It's that it's, it's that um, collaboration between subject matter experts yeah. and the creative and the technology is, yes. is really the secret sauce. And exactly. in the exactly. beginning. Exactly. Absolutely. Um, well, I want to thank you so much, Gabu, for joining us. Um, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Um, and Michael, thank you uh, for inviting me to participate. Thank you so much, uh, both of you, Gabo and Susanna. That was just fantastic. Really appreciate it all. Um, especially how you centered human experience and artistic expression and particularly storytelling um, as a through line for the adoption of technologies and drawing that distinction between creativity and innovation. I think that's a, really helps center us um, on human experience. Um, and I think too, that when we think about educational technology, we think so much about content delivery when really it's it's more if we're zooming out about why why we why we contemplate education in the first place it's about cultivating human potential and i think nothing really speaks louder about that than than your work so thank you um, thank, thank you both you.